Hello everyone, and welcome back to my Xbox 360 collection video. I'd recommend checking out part 1 if you haven't, or you're going to be pretty confused. In part 2 we're going to be covering my non-backward compatible titles. This half of the collection will definitely feature a lot of the more obscure games that Microsoft doesn't care about, but you should because that still leaves about half of the 360's library. And there's still a lot of really great games there, even if you have to play them on the actual 360. I'll of course continue giving you guys the insider knowledge from my years of experience and research with the 360 to help you collect for this console, and I'll also be showing off some of my favorite games, some hidden gems to keep an eye out for, and my more expensive titles. Well, expensive as far as the 360 is concerned anyway. If the PS3 is your primary console and you're just here to see what the 360 has to offer, then don't worry because the first category of games we're going to be looking at is exclusives. Every game has been split up by genre, so if there's a specific type of game that you're looking for, check out the chapters down below or in the description. We have a lot of ground to cover today, so let's get going. It's sad to see how little Microsoft has cared about exclusives for the last decade, but back on the 360 this is still one of our largest categories. I've again split these up into subsections from the most to least exclusive. Starting off, these are the truest of true exclusives, games that can only be played on actual 360 hardware or through emulation. America's Army True Soldiers is an officially licensed American Army video game. This is what taxpayer money goes to in America. Two of them, actually. I've played about halfway through the first game, and it's actually a pretty decent military simulator RPG. There was a mission I got stuck on though, so I need to go back and finish it one of these days. By comparison, the few minutes that I've played of the sequel were pretty awful. I wanted to get some actual gameplay, but the horrific frame rate started giving me a headache immediately, and it also seems to have about half the missions and servicemen roles as its predecessor. If you can stomach the utter flagrancy of this series for long enough to play it, I'd probably recommend sticking with the first one. Amped is a series that I really loved as a kid, and that was because I didn't play the third game, apparently. Amped 3 was a launch title for the 360, and it really doesn't give off a good first impression. This one ditches the tight balance of arcade and simulation gameplay that the first two had and tonally diverges from its forebears about as much as possible, going from a grounded climb to become the world's best to... Wienerland! It's the radical new snow surfing action playset that provides hours of jibtastic fun. Included are action figures you can pretend are your friends and make them say whatever you want. Yeah, whatever that is. They decided to give you a crew in this game, and the only thing they had to do was make the majority of them bearable, but they failed at that pretty spectacularly. At least it still retains what is in my view the most important part of the series, an enormous 300 plus track, 15 hour long licensed soundtrack full of indie metal, punk, hip hop, and electronica. If the soundtrack wasn't on point, you couldn't even call yourself amped. I haven't gotten too far into this one yet for obvious reasons, but maybe I'll force myself to play through it someday. Blackwater the game not only brought the infamous real world private military company's many scandals back into the public discourse, but it was also one of the worst games ever made for the 360. Apparently the Kinect controls aren't half bad though. I'll have to do a playthrough of this someday just for the memes. Well, that's enough controversy for now. Nah, shit. Uh, Dead or Alive Extreme 2 is the game. Um, yeah, I have, I have no excuse for this. Dead or Alive is my favorite fighting game series since I first played it on original Xbox. The roster is huge and varied and the mechanics are easy to pick up, but still have a lot of depth. Uh, this isn't a regular Dead or Alive game though. It's a fun minigame collection that has outstanding graphics, solid mechanics, and groundbreaking physics. Um, it's a surprisingly good volleyball game though, not too many of those out there. My copy is actually pretty water damaged, which you could take as being either thematic or horrifying, or both. Anyway, moving on. Fusion Frenzy was an awesome party game on the original Xbox, but pretty much everyone agrees the second one sucks. I played Star Wars Kinect for a couple hours not too long ago, and I was honestly almost pleasantly surprised. Especially by the pod racing portion, which works a lot better than it has any right to. Never thought I'd say this, but I'm actually looking forward to getting farther into it. 99 Nights is a game of the crowd combat variety, like the Dynasty Warriors or Kingdom Under Fire series. It has several playable characters with their own movesets that flow together well, beautiful cutscenes, and a decent enough plot progression, at least by the genre standards. Even though it got middling reviews at the time, it's now considered one of the better games in that sub-sub-genre, so maybe something to pick up if you enjoy that style of gameplay. Never really been my thing though, honestly. Naruto Rise of a Ninja is one of the more unique Naruto games that we got. While the combat is a typical one-on-one -on -one fighter, there's also RPG and platforming elements that help change up the experience, including a fully explorable Konoha village. This game follows the first few major arcs of the show, from the Land of Waves up until Konoha Crush. Definitely one of the titles to check out if you're a fan of the series, along with its sequel, The Broken Bond, which I haven't been able to get my hands on yet. But both games combined cover the entire canon of the original show. Next up is Otomedius, or Otome Gradius Excellent. 
This is a spin-off of the Gradius series, where you play as whatever the midpoint of a mecha and a magical girl is. It's always nice to see another cute em up game, as they are quite rare, but this one is unfortunately nothing special. A lot more could have been done to spice up the graphics, as the art style is that very distinct early 3D that just looks kinda uggo. It does, however, include a plethora of customization options and a large cast of playable characters, plus a three-player co-op mode, which is an enormous saving grace. Having a co-op mode is always a must for shmups in my book. Strangely, this game got insanely dumpstered by critics, and while I don't think it's the best game ever, after skimming some reviews it looks to me like they were just mad cause bad. Shoot'em ups are one of the genres that always gain in value, but this one has remained relatively cheap, so if you want it, I'd pick it up sooner rather than later, but there are many better shmups on the console. Project Sylphid has been covered by a few other people, but allow me to add my voice to the chorus. Of all the non back and pad exclusives, I think this is the best. It's a spiritual successor to the Sylphid series of rail shooters, but it's made by the same developer, Game Arts, who are more well known for such bangers as Gun Griffin, Elysia Dragoon, Lunar, and Grandia. Unlike the original Sylphids, this is a full fledged space shooter with arcadey controls, lavish graphics, an engaging soundtrack, and way deeper story than you'd expect. The critics were out of their gourds on this one. It's one of the best flight sims I've played in a long time. Now I'm sure many of you are thinking, aggroed you dumb idiot loser, Rock Band 3 isn't an exclusive, and you know, that's, that's pretty mean. But there's an aspect of it that more or less means that it is. This is the only plastic instrument game worth getting nowadays, because custom songs are still being made for it all the time. There are a few custom songs for the Wii and PS3 versions of the game, but compare 400 customs to almost 30,000 songs for the 360. You also need to mod your PS3 or Wii to play customs, but that's not necessary here. You do need to make sure that you get the disc that was published by EA, because that's the one that doesn't have built-in patches. The Mad Cats and Games on Demand versions will not work. The service for purchasing new songs have closed down by now, so this is the only way to get new content. Thankfully that community is still very much alive and well. I'll link a starter guide for getting custom songs down in the description if you guys are interested. It's not as hard as it sounds. If even I can figure it out, then I have full faith in you guys. I ended up getting both versions of Soul Cal 4 because unfortunately the DLC for the game that allowed you to play as Darth Vader, Yoda, and Galen Merrick is no longer available, so you need each version of the game to play as Yoda and Darth Vader. Soul Calibur is of course one of the best fighting game series of all time, but to me this game mostly serves as a reminder that we've still never gotten a good Star Wars fighting game to this day. Wow, a good fighting game? You mean like me? Hey yo, what about me? I'm fun, I have good mechanics. Here, watch this. Call this a fight? Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong, you're great, but we need more characters. There's like four people that even know who Syndrolic is. Oh, well, w w what about me? Oh yeah, here we go! I mean, the animations need a lot of work and the cast isn't very balanced yet, but this is what I'm talking about! This is what we've all been waiting for, let me try it out! The Gunstringer is usually considered the best game that came out for the Kinect, and that actually means a lot more than you might think. You puppeteer the titular Gunslinger by moving him around with your left hand and aiming with your right. The controls actually work quite well and allow you to get into a groove really quickly. The game plays like a rail shooter, taking clear inspiration from the Panzer Dragoon series with how you aim. Or you know, res I guess if you're a normie. You swipe over targets to get a lock on and then release a hot barrage of lead upon your enemies all at once. You can still find this game for really cheap, so if you have a Kinect you should definitely pick it up. And here's a game you've never seen before. Vortex Senko no Ronde is a port of an arcade mecha fighter that looked really cool originally, but after playing it for a few minutes the combat is just kind of flaccid and uninteresting. I'll give it a full playthrough one of these days, but for now it's just not really holding my attention. Moving on, these are the exclusives that did get a release on PC, but if you want to get them on console, they're only on 360. Dark Messiah of Might and Magic Elements is a spin-off of the very long-running Might and Magic series of Western RPGs. It reminds me a lot of Oblivion, so maybe something to play while we wait another 8-12 to 12 years for Elder Scrolls VI to come out. It's a game that was made by Arcane Studios, who used to make good stuff, so I have high expectations for it. Especially because the fantasy RPG that they released just prior to it, Arx Fatalis, has received a lot of praise in recent years. Speaking of Arcane, Prey 2006, no relation, is a sci-fi FPS where you try to save your girlfriend and grandpa from an alien abduction. You can traverse open-ended environments with portals, gravity control, and your mystical Native American powers. No, seriously. You know, just your average everyday game. Prey 2006 was absurdly ahead of its time in a lot of ways, but like most great FPS games in the 7th generation that weren't Battle Halo Cod, it was mostly ignored at the time. I'd really recommend giving this one a try. 
Just don't ask any Prey fans about the sequel, they're still not over it. Stoked it does have a big air edition that comes with a lot more content, but they did away with the gorgeous cover art of the original, so you know me. I'm honestly more excited for this game than I am for Amp 3, as it seems to have carried over the spirit of the Amp series more than Amp 3 did, sticking more to a down-to-earth story and tone rather than trying to bring in the stoner 12-year-old demographic, since apparently they think that's a thing. Anyway, maybe something to check out if Amp 3 was as big of a disappointment for you as it was for me. Of the very few people that have even played The Last Remnant, most say that the cover is the most interesting thing about it, and that's why I haven't dove in yet. It's considered painfully mediocre, so probably just skip this one. It did get a remaster on PS4 and Switch, but that didn't release physically, so if you want to grab it with your meat hooks, it's only on 360. Which reminds me, when collecting for this generation, keep in mind that just because Wikipedia says a game was re-released or remastered on 8th gen, that doesn't mean it released physically, not at all. The easiest way to tell if something got a physical release is just to search it on eBay. If an item does not appear in eBay's records, it does not exist. Oof, from painfully average to just plain painful, the Two Worlds series is not very good. Um, basically no one liked these games, and the second one was so bad that it had a hand in putting its publisher out of business. Honestly, I haven't been mad enough at my 360 to punish it by inserting these games in the disk drive yet. Velvet Assassin probably isn't a diamond hidden in the rough, more like a hidden dime, but it's still worth a look. It's a stealth game set in World War II that was inspired by the real-life exploits of Violette Zabo, a French SOE agent during the war. Most reviewers took umbrage with the difficulty more than anything, but it also lacked a lot of polish in the AI and performance departments. However, it's still a decent stealth game that doesn't shy away from the darker elements of the war. Stealth games are so rare, and I love the setting enough that I was willing to give this one a try, and I'm glad I did. Y'all know the drill by now, these are the HD exclusives. Games that released on portable or 6th gen that were ported onto the 360, so these are effectively the definitive edition of each game. The Dreamcast collection was heavily derided at the time for being a compilation that only contains four games, which is especially unfortunate now that the prices of Dreamcast games have risen substantially. Also a big mark against it is that the port of Sonic Adventure is actually the awful DX version from the GameCube. That said, you do get Space Channel 5 Part 2, which was previously only released on the PS2 in America, and a faithful port of Crazy Taxi as well. Both are excellent games, but I think Space Channel 5 is basically the Dreamcast in a nutshell. Sega's last hurrah in the console market boasted a lot of arcade ports, but the original games that released for it were just completely weird and unique in the best possible way, and this is one of them. It's a rhythm game where you play as sci-fi news reporter Ulala, who has to use the power of dance to take down the rhythm rogues and save the galaxy. The soundtrack of the second game was also composed in part by the one and only Michael Jackson, who if you don't know was a huge Sega fan. He also appears in game as the resplendent Space Michael. Both Space Channel 5 games are must-plays on the Dreamcast, and thankfully you can get Part 2 along with Crazy Taxi on this collection with a better resolution for a lesser cost. Oh, and also it has Sega bass fishing, I guess. Gun doesn't give off the best first impression in the world, but it's regarded as one of the better Western shooters out there. I haven't gotten around to it yet though, so I'll have to see if its reputation is earned. In the meantime, play Dead Man's Hand. It's great. Pocket Bike Racer is one of three licensed Burger King games that were sold by the company to hopefully entice some poor soul to actually buy one of their sandwiches while they were there. None of them are great games, but PBR is actually a pretty decent Mario Kart clone. Instead of picking up boxes, you go through gates to get points, and you can use those points on whatever gadgets you can afford, from bottle rockets to flashbangs, or you can just use it as a boost instead. Granted, there's not a lot of content in this game at all. Only a few bikes and a minuscule five tracks means that you'll be finished with it pretty quick. But there are so many copies of these things floating around and they're worth so little that you can probably talk a game store into just giving you a copy for free with another purchase. Saves them shell space and it's a good hour or two of entertainment, so hell, I'd recommend it. TMNT 2007 is both one of the better Turtles movies and games that we've gotten in recent memory. It feels good to play and features missions that put each of the Turtles in the limelight for a while. If you're a TMNT devotee like me, then you should check it out. And now for the rest of the video, we're going to be doing first-person shooters. If you don't like first-person shooters, then clear on out. I mean, not really, but sometimes it feels like that, right? Better releases of all the Borderlands games have come out since that include more of the DLC, but if you want all the major DLCs fully physical, then this is still the only way to get it. It does come with some caveats, though. It, of course, doesn't have Borderlands 2's last DLC, Commander Lilith and the Fight for Sanctuary, because that just released in 2019. And also, the triple pack version of 2's DLC specifically is not backward compatible, and neither is any of the pre-sequel. Basically, I just keep this around as a backup. Enemy Front is one of the lowest rated games on the 360, but I love World War II shooters enough that I'm willing to give it a try. I'll definitely play it on stream once I get around to it so that you guys can all experience how 
special it is alongside me. Singularity and Wolfenstein 2009 are two excellent FPS titles that very few people have heard of, and even fewer have played. They were made by the awesome devs over at Raven Software, who, regrettably nowadays, you probably know mostly from their work as a support studio in Call of Duty. But they also made the superb Heretic and Hexen series, and some of the best X-Men, Marvel, and Star Wars games ever released back when they were still developing their own titles. Both games feature a variety of powerful weapons, crazy sci-fi powers to mess around with, and an ominous atmosphere with a bit of light horror thrown in there for extra measure. Please, please check out both of these FPS gems. They deserve a lot more love. The seventh generation is when we saw nearly every AA developer get acquired and usually dissolved by large publishers, which was a large contributing factor to the lack of creativity and vision we've seen in the last decade. Raven Software, of course, being a prime example of that. Hopefully we'll get to see another true release from them eventually. As you'll see though, not a single game Raven made was backward compatible, and they're all bangers. Listen Microsoft, I don't know what you have against this company, but... No. No. Like Enemy Front, Turning Point Fall of Liberty also received pretty abysmal reviews, but it looked to be a bit better than its fellow flop, and it's also an alternate history game where you fight the German occupation of New York, so it's safe to say I have much higher hopes for this one. Here we have some western RPGs, and while most of them are simple action RPGs or dungeon crawlers, the first one is a lot more unique. Alpha Protocol is a secret agent RPG, which takes a lot of cues from Mass Effect 1 with a combination of stat-based third-person shooter gameplay accounting for various playstyles and a vast number of decisions to be made that have wide-ranging ramifications for the plot. The difference is, this game actually does the latter a whole lot better. Dear viewer, have you ever been disappointed by a game appearing on the surface to have a plot that can butterfly in any direction, but in the end the choices you get ultimately lead toward a lot of the same conclusions? Well, dear viewer, first of all you have no idea how insanely difficult it would be to make a game like that, and your discontent was brought about by your own far too lofty expectations, but secondly, this is the game for you because it pulls it off better than any game I've seen to date. The amount of permutations that your choices can lead to in this game is completely absurd, and despite all the vast jank, it's worth playing just to watch it all unfold. Yes, unfortunately this game was pushed out far before it was ready, leading to low sales, middling critical reception, including a damning 2 out of 10 from Jim Sterling, and an overall just big ol' mess. It's since been patched as much as it could be, but a lot of the glitches still remain and do hamper the experience. The gameplay is also going to be difficult for new players to understand, which might lead to frustrations, but even so, I'd urge you to give this game a try. It's not often that we see something with this level of ambition, even at the time that it came out. As can be said for, well, most of Obsidian's games. If you can enjoy it for what it is rather than what it isn't, it's still incredible to see how good this game could have been had it just had a little more time in the oven. In what would typically be a very un-Sega-like move, the company seems to have a vendetta against this game because of how poorly it performed due in no small part to their own meddling, but regardless, they've specifically stopped this game from being made backward compatible, and have said they're never going to port it or make a sequel. They've been doing their best to bury this game, but I think it deserves more than that. A lot more. Please, Sega, this isn't like you. You're scaring me. <coughs> if you don't like it, then trust me, I get it, but you should at least give it a go. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Moving on to a less controversial game, this is the special edition of Marvel Ultimate Alliance. It originally only came in the Greatest Hits package, so I decided to get a new cover for it. This is my most expensive game for the 360, and despite it being ported a million times, there is a good reason for that. It originally came out on the 6th generation, but was then ported to 360 and PS3, which added in two new characters. Then a year later, they released the Gold and Special Editions only on 360. The difference being that those releases had eight additional playable characters and also had enhanced graphics due to them no longer needing to be based off of the 6th gen release. The 360 versions have since been ported onto the PS4 and 1, but due to someone majorly screwing up, the additional characters from the Golden Special Editions weren't put on the physical disc when it was re-released on 8th gen. So that's why I have this version. I went with the Special Edition because it's much less expensive and it also has a bonus disc with some trailers and a making of video. <sighs> okay, I think that covers everything. Oh, right, the game. Uh, it's easily one of the best dungeon crawlers ever made, especially if you like Marvel stuff. Solid gameplay and an utterly enormous cast, levels that don't overstay their welcome, crazy boss fights. I think these games are kind of underrated, honestly. Definitely pick it up along with its sequel, which is just as good on the gameplay front, but features a better plot as it follows the Secret War and Civil War storylines. 2 does also have a variant with a bonus comic book, so keep an eye out for that. After that, everything else here is kind of cheeks, though. I was interested in Rise of the Argonauts and Venetica because of their mythological Greek and fantasy Renaissance Venetian settings respectively, but saying that they weren't exactly critical or commercial darlings would be an understatement. And X-Men Destiny literally put its devs out of business, so rip in peace, Silicon Knights. You will be remembered for those, like, one and a half good games you made. 
There are still a few quality hack and slash and beat em up games that were never made backward compatible. Afro Samurai is based around the anime of the same name, and like its inspiration, it stars Samuel L. Jackson as the main character in a gory, foul mouthed, no holds barred romp with beautiful cell shaded visuals and an intense soundtrack. No idea what the critics were thinking on this one, as usual. Definitely check it out. Anarchy Reigns is the very much lesser known sequel to Mad World on the Wii. Now featuring colors aside from Mad World's signature Dead Penguin palette, it also has two campaigns and two protagonists with differing fighting styles. Plus, you can play as Bayonetta with the DLC. This game was the king of going under the radar, but it still has all the same awesome action from the first game and more. Lollipop Chainsaw was easily the most mainstream of Suda51's titles, but looking back on it, I don't think it's as unique or refined as his other games. The gameplay can drag in a lot of places, and the tone can be really hit or miss. And that's coming from a big fan of this studio. It's still good, but it's just kind of average as far as Grasshopper games go. I wasn't all that surprised to find that of the 360 hack and slash trilogy, this was the game that got left out of the back compat list. Here come the boys at Raven Software again with another fantastic game. Don't be scared off by the title. Despite the movie being a crime against mutant kind, this adaptation is thankfully a lot closer to Logan in terms of style and quality. Your only goal in this game is to go on the largest psychopathic blood soaked rampage that you can manage. If you like X-Men even a little bit, this game is a must play. Just make sure to pick it up on 360 or PS3 where it didn't get censored, and grab it sooner rather than later because it's been steadily climbing in price for the last few years. When I first saw this game, I misread it as Yabai Ninja Gaiden Z, and that actually would have been more accurate. They had a good concept going, but this game lacked the polish it needed to, well, be playable. Even if you're a fan of the series, please don't play this. You'll probably have a better time seeing how loud of a noise your femur can make. Once again, our JRPG section is looking pretty sad and lonely over here, because we've covered most of our noteworthy games in part one, but we still have a few of them. Record of Agorist War is a series of pretty underrated strategy RPGs in my opinion. The depth of gameplay will probably leave veterans of the genre wanting, but it's still serviceable, and these games are unique as far as I'm aware in that they include a dating sim portion where you have three heroines that you can court over the course of the game, eventually settling down with one of them, having children, and then the game continues on from there with your child as the main character. Overall, you have a total of five generations to work your way through, making this an absurdly long game, even for a JRPG. You should also know going in that with a premise like that, you should expect this game to have a fair bit of, um, plot. While Record 2 was only released on the PS3, you want to get the 360 versions of the first two games, as they have a good chunk of extra content. The first game also got ported to the Switch recently, but the 360 version is just as good and costs less than half as much. Speaking of extra content, I actually ended up getting the collector's edition of the first game by pure coincidence. I only got this because it's a hard game to find and the store I bought it from wouldn't split up the package. Yeah, fucking right. <laughs> Ignore that. Though I did actually get it for less than the base game was worth. Anyway, it comes with some paraphernalia featuring two of the girls from the game. A lovely stylized pillowcase, very nice, and this mouse pad that has two very conveniently placed pads for your wrist. Um, yeah. Believe it or not, this is actually the only Opie mouse pad I own. Oh god, I've lost all credibility, haven't I? Oh well. Quickly moving on, Residents of Fate is probably the most controversial JRPG of the entire generation. If you can subjugate your humanity long enough to learn the outrageously convoluted battle system and grind for long enough to beat the game's many difficulty spikes, then you'll be rewarded with one of the better JRPGs of the era, but it's completely understandable that most players don't get far enough into it to see this game's brilliance. This is another example of a game that got a remaster on 8th gen, but was never released physically in English outside of the very rare Korean version. Always, always make sure that you check eBay for the physical release before you mark a game off your list just because Wikipedia says it got a remaster. Next up, we have the extensive action adventure slash open world genre. These are both the Game of the Year editions for Arkham Asylum and City, which contain all the DLC physically, but were only released as greatest hits packages, so I got a new cover for them. Cities is especially horrid, like, what the hell were y'all thinking? There is a very good reason I have both of these games on 360, rather than the Return to Arkham collection that was released for 8th gen. It's simply one of the worst remasters I've seen in a very long time, to the point where it's actually almost a demake of both games. You have a slightly increased resolution and frame rate, but it's not even an upscale to true 1080p and fluctuates constantly between scenes. They also locked the frame rate at 45 FPS, meaning that unless you have a FreeSync monitor, you have constant stuttering throughout the games. Also, every texture they changed was a straight up downgrade, especially for the Joker, who instead of being gross and intimidating now looks like he's made out of Play-Doh. 
The same can also be said for most of the character models in the game. On top of that, they put a filter over most of the game that changed the feel from an intense trek through a sinister, dilapidated world into a kitty carnival ride. Everything is so saturated, there's not a shadow to be found, it's just gaudy. It looks closer to Times Square than Gotham. These games were lauded for their dark, claustrophobic atmosphere and for not handling Batman with kitty gloves, but all that is gone here. They seriously couldn't have screwed it up more if they tried, it's embarrassing. The few things performance-wise that aren't worse in this supposed remaster all do their best to wreck the vision of the original games instead. We saw this thing quite a lot with remasters from 7th to 8th gen. Another notable demake to next gen consoles was Heavy Rain, which is on the same level as this. Just because something calls itself a remaster doesn't mean it was actually an improvement in any way. Make sure to thoroughly research both versions before deciding which one to get. Again, huge shout out to Austin SV for doing the Lord's work. I put these games in the non-backward compatible section because even though they will run on a 1 or series, I haven't been able to personally confirm whether or not it will download a patch for them that upgrades them to the remastered versions. So just be aware that if you do run them back in pat, you could be playing the Return to Ass editions. I really loved the first Mercenaries, but the second one was ultimately a huge letdown. Check out my 2022 ranking video if you'd like to hear more about that, but long story short, just stick to the first one. Prototype 2 is one of the multiplats that runs substantially better on the PS3, so you want to pick that one up over there. This trilogy of Spider-Man games are some of the best ever made. They're not perfect, and if you're coming off Marvel Spider-Man, then the lack of an open world in Edge of Time and Shadow Dimensions might be a bit jarring, but instead of an open world, you have this thing we used to call level design, and a tight, well-paced, handcrafted experience. It's good stuff, trust me. Shadow Dimensions is generally considered to be the best of the three. It was doing multiverse storylines before the MCU was even potty trained. You get to play as the OG Wallcrawler, plus Spider-Man Noir, Ultimate Spider-Man, and my favorite, Spidey 2099. It also has a distinct visual style for each that matches their unique worlds. Edge of Time had the misfortune of coming out after Shattered Dimensions and was overly compared to that game to the point of parody, meaning that it got thrashed by reviewers that couldn't see the game for its own merits. It acts as a direct sequel to Shattered Dimensions and brought the story to a satisfying conclusion. Considering they had less than a year to make it, Edge of Time still ended up being pretty solid. The best story has to go to Web of Shadows, though. New York City has been overrun with a symbiote invasion before the game even begins, and it's up to Spider-Man to try and pick up the pieces of his post-apocalyptic city. It also has branching storylines and moral dilemmas to explore as you decide how best to save Manhattan from annihilation. All three of these games have been delisted from online stores due to the usual licensing issues, so the only way to get them is physically. Meaning that over the years, this trilogy has slowly crept up in price until now they're some of the most expensive games on the console. To make matters worse, every time a Spider-Man movie comes out, they balloon in price by more than 200%, especially after No Way Home. If you plan on getting these games anytime soon, you're going to want to get them before June 2nd when Across the Spider-Verse comes out and they skyrocket again. Also, Web of Shadows does have a rare edition with an art book, so that's something to keep an eye out for. My opinion on The Amazing Spider-Man has actually softened a bit since I played it last year. It's not a very long game, but the story is well told, the combat ranges from serviceable to quite good in its better moments, and the graphics are nigh on jaw-dropping by 360 standards. It's still not the best Spider-Man game out there, but I think you should at least give it a go. Just whatever you do, do not play the second one. If you've never heard of the Saboteur, the easiest way to explain it is that it's the World War II Assassin's Creed that we never got, parkour and all. While it is a bit unfinished, at least by the standards of the time, Pandemic Swan Song remains a hidden gem that combines spectacle with a lot of gameplay variety to keep things fresh. I'd recommend it for anyone who's looking for something to play while we wait for Mirage to stop getting delayed. The Godfather games really went under the radar, but they generally do right by the source material while also having a partly original story, and they're impressive open world games regardless. The first one you do want to get on PS3 because it runs a lot better over there. The era of pure horror on consoles pretty much came and went with the 6th generation, but the 360 did get a host of hybrid horror first-person shooters. Black Sight Area 51 is the much lesser known sequel to the excellent Area 51 on Xbox and PS2. It doesn't really live up to its predecessor though. This time around you have a squad with you for the majority of the game, and most of the levels are open spaces that don't provide much in the way of tension. With the rating changed from mature to teen and the changes to gameplay and atmosphere, you can hardly even call it a horror game anymore. I'd just stick with the first one. Clive Barker's Jericho, however, is something of a hidden gem among horror titles on the 360. You command a squad known as Jericho, a seven-man team of commandos that specialize in fighting the occult with different weaponry and abilities. Unlike Black Sight, this game still manages to be creepy, even with a fire team full of badasses at your command. However, despite trying to inject some life into the visuals by taking you to a few different locales, the game can often look very samey. 
If you ask someone who's just finished it to identify where you are in a screenshot of the game, you'd probably get a lot of blank stares. The story's also nothing to write home about, despite being penned by an acclaimed horror author. Overall, though, it's still well worth picking up, especially if you're looking for something to scratch that first encounter assault recon itch. I really enjoyed Condemned Criminal Origins, but I haven't dived into the second one yet, mostly because I've heard it's not as good, but I'll still have to give it a shot one of these days. The 2008 reboot of Turok is also rather underappreciated, is what I would have said halfway through the game. The weapons all feel unique and have just the right level of efficacy, plus they can be dual wielded, which is always a good way to make your gunplay more awesome. Currently, no, that's, that's not in the cards right now. The animations make the dinos in this game feel so alive, and they're really intimidating. The same can't be said for the generic bad guys that you also spend a lot of the game fighting, especially in the latter half. The aim punch and the fairly low player health really makes fighting them a chore. Also, I know you don't play Turok games for the story, but it's painfully bad in this one. I definitely get why it garnered such low review scores. At the time, the entire industry was getting really tired of third-person shooters, but honestly, with how unique and varied pretty much all of these games have been, I just don't get where they're coming from. And that continues with the non back compat TPSs. Bloodstone 007 is one of the best games of the entire James Bond lineup, but unlike Goldeneye and Nightfire, no one even knows it exists. It features Daniel Craig in an adventure that both does justice to its world and is its own completely original story, rather than being based off of a movie. I'm sad to say this game was the swan song of Bizarre Creations, the studio that gave us Project Gotham Racing, Geometry Wars, and Blur, but what a way to go out. As you'd expect, the driving set pieces in this game are smooth as butter, and despite the devs having precious little shooter experience, it still manages to play well and make you feel like a badass super spy. This one is worth playing even for someone who's unfamiliar with the franchise. Fracture, Fuse, and Inversion were three games that had a lot of potential, each featuring their own cool gameplay gimmicks, and even being developed by accomplished studios like Insomniac, Saber, and Day One. But they didn't live up to what they could have been. I'd still say critics were a bit too harsh here, though. If you see them for cheap, I think they're worth a shot. Fracture's storyline in particular will hit a fair bit harder than it did when the game was released. John Woo presents Stranglehold, however, well, let's just say you're not here for the plot. This game is basically Max Payne on crack. It combines the innovative bullet time of that series with absolutely over-the-top action and gorgeous destructible environments to give us the pinnacle of fast-paced action movie shootouts. Of all the Max Payne clones that we saw in the 2000s, this is head and shoulders above the rest. My only issue with this game is that it can get a little repetitive during long play sessions, but if you don't rush through it and instead just play it every once in a while, savor the experience, then this will end up being one of your favorite shooters ever. The Club is a very experimental title in that it's almost more of a racing game than it is a shooter. You get your pick of eight playable characters who are invited to the Club, an underground blood sport ring that pits various misfits from psychopaths to detectives against each other to see how quickly they can complete a course while killing everything in sight and maintaining a high combo. This is another game by Bizarre Creations and published by Sega, but even with that level of backing I didn't find out about this game until I was getting deep into the 360's library. There are 48 total levels that you can compete for the best score in, and each character has their own backstory and ending, but that's all there really is in the story department. Personally, it's not really my cup of tea, but if you're looking for something truly unprecedented, it's a cool game. The Transformers movie tie-in games really aren't anything special, unfortunately. They have decent enough mechanics, but the level design really drags them down. However, we also got what are unanimously considered the best Transformers games of all time, the Cybertron duology. In fact, they're not just good for Transformers games, they're two of the must-play third-person shooters of the generation. You have extremely tight controls, plenty of playable characters, and a story that follows my favorite part of the chronology. Despite having a small 15 minutes when they first came out, these games were largely overshadowed by COD and Gears which were reaching their peak at the time. Nowadays though, people are starting to realize what they missed out on, which means they've quickly become one of the most expensive games on the 360, and they're only going to keep climbing. I can't recommend them enough, so I'd advise you to pick them up before they get too expensive. Finally we have Wet, a game that also went under the radar at release, but one that people are really starting to come around to. It also has very prevalent bullet time, but mixes up the gameplay with acrobatics and melee combat. It's nothing off the wall incredible, but if you're willing to enjoy it for what it is, then you'll have a great time. And unfortunately it's probably the closest we'll ever get to playing Revy in a video game. 
Again, we don't have too many adventure games for the 360, but everything here is at least worth a look. Majin and the Forsaken Kingdom got middling reviews from critics at the time, due in large part to its more lighthearted tone that simply wasn't in vogue during the seventh generation. But now that juvenile elitism is mostly a thing of the past, you'll find that Majin is one of the generation's most overlooked gens. It has gameplay that could best be described as the midpoint between The Last Guardian and Legend of Zelda, where you and your monster solve puzzles and fight together to cleanse your kingdom of a mysterious darkness. Yeah, the plot's not exactly Xenogears, but it's about the journey more than anything, which still manages to resonate emotionally as you learn about and spend time with your gigantic companion. It starts out slow, but if you stick with it, I think a lot of people will find a game they'll fall in love with. Speaking of juvenile elitism, Prince of Persia 2007. In a rare twist of fate, this game got glowing reviews from critics but was shunned by the larger gaming community, who thought it was a dumb stupid baby game because you technically couldn't die in it. Back in reality though, this is easily one of the top three Prince games ever. An elegant art style that hides the game's age, a parkour system that flows together effortlessly, and a gripping storyline that rivals the likes of Sands of Time make this a must-play of the generation that few people have given the time of day. Hopefully that changes sometime in the future. Just don't play the epilogue, trust me on this one. We also have Remember Me, which was the first game of Don't Nod, the creators of Life is Strange and Vampire. I'm a big fan of theirs, but I still haven't dove into this one yet. It's considered pretty hit or miss, so your mileage may vary. I only have two video game compilations this time, again compilation meaning two or more games on the disc, but they're both great releases. Despite its confusing title, which is probably why no one bought it, Sonic's Ultimate Genesis Collection is not a collection of just Sonic games. Instead, it's jam-packed with 48 classic games from the 16-bit machine, including 7 arcade ports and 2 Master System ports that you can't get anywhere else. But Agrid, I hear you ask at 2am when I'm trying to sleep, how does this stack up to other Genesis collections that were released before and since? That's an excellent question, Shirley, thank you for asking. I was wondering the same thing, so I did what any self-respecting nerd would do. I made a spreadsheet. There are really only four Genesis collections worth picking up nowadays. Those are the Sonic's Ultimate Genesis Collection, the Sega Classics Collection, don't get the Switch version, and the Genesis Mini 1 and 2 consoles. All of these have their own games list, including many games that are exclusive to each release. So in the description of the video, you can find a spreadsheet where I've detailed which games are included in which release and which are exclusive to each release. Now these do have some Sonic games on them, but I stress these are Genesis collections, not Sonic collections. If you're looking for good Sonic compilations, I would direct you toward the Sonic Mega and Gems collections released during the 6th generation. All of these releases are amazing though. I plan on getting all four of them because that's way cheaper than getting all the games individually. I know some people will ask whether the emulation is perfect or not, and the answer is always going to be no. Emulation will never be perfect, but that said, Sega is probably the best at it. I've seen very few complaints about the performance of the games on any of these releases. If you're an absolute purist though, the only way to go is original hardware. And I know that you know this, so please stop asking. <laughs> Something to note though is that emulated games will nearly always run better on Xbox consoles, because the architecture is much closer to that of a PC than Sony's or Nintendo's, so if you have the option, I'd recommend picking up any retro collections on Xbox. Okay, big topic, sorry about that. We also have The Chronicles of Riddick Assault on Dark Athena. This is the sequel to the highly lauded Escape from Butcher Bay on original Xbox. This game doesn't quite live up to its predecessor's greatness, but it's still an awesome game in its own right. However, what makes this something you need to pick up is that it includes a full remaster of the original Escape from Butcher Bay, which is now running on Dark Athena's new engine. Even if you aren't familiar with Riddick, these games are still must-plays. Not many people know that these games were also made by Starbreeze Studios, the developers of The Darkness, Syndicate, Brothers of Tale of Two Sons, and Payday 2. It's an absolutely goaded studio. Thankfully, after dropping off the map for a while, they're now hard at work on Payday 3. Finally, the last category we have is miscellaneous games. Fighting, music, racing, flying whatever I couldn't find a place for elsewhere. Battle Fantasia is a game that I doubt too many people have heard of, but it's actually made by Arc System, who are fighting game royalty. This one didn't turn out as good as Guilty Gear or Blaze Blue, though. It's honestly probably a skip. Make sure you get the extend version of Blaze Blue Continuum Shift if you want to pick it up, because it has a lot of additional content and better balancing. I wanted to group these three games together because they are all combat racing games. Split Second was in part one and is backward compatible, but I didn't have the time to talk about it then. Blur is more or less what would happen if Need for Speed and Mario Kart had a baby, where you race with real cars, but you also have various powers that you can pick up and use against your opponents, which means that it combines two of my favorite things, driving exotic cars and pissing off my friends. Seriously though, the graphics are excellent, it's easy to pick up, it plays fantastically, I don't know how it sold so poorly. Most people know about that nowadays though, thanks to Jason. What I doubt you've seen though is Fatal Inertia. This game is much more akin to Wipeout, but the physics are very floaty and hard to get a handle on at first. After just a bit of practice, you can really fly once you get the hang of it though. 
The power-ups are also fairly unique, like shooting weighted magnets onto other vehicles to slow them down, or this one where I shoot a grappling hook onto the guy in front of me to pull him behind me and shoot me forward. I end up winning the race because of it. Again, it can be a little wonky at first, but if you stick with it, this is a really underrated racing gem. Thank you to the guy who decided to put a little bit of extra pizzazz on my copy. This is my favorite though, which is why I'm going to show it off in this video. Yeah, this game rips, dude. It's basically Ridge Racer! Directed by Michael Bay. It can definitely be tough sometimes, because as far as I can tell, there's no rubber banding in this game, so if you fall behind, you may as well start over. It would have helped if you could use the energy for a boost to catch up, but no dice. Still though, it's a completely unprecedented racing experience that no one should miss. Finally, what you've all been waiting for, Death Smiles. This is one of, if not the best shoot 'em up on the 360, at least as far as original titles are concerned. It has five playable characters with different attacks, multiple branching paths to complete, and a gorgeous gothic fantasy art style, which is something rarely seen in the genre. The difficulty is also spot on for my taste. It can get very bullet hell in some sections, but a newer shmup player will be able to finish it without too much trouble. If you're a hardened Toho god that wants to one credit clear it though, you're still gonna have a bit of work cut out for you. This is one of my favorite shmups ever, and one of the best of all time. It has since re-released on the Switch along with the second game, which was the first time that 2 was released physically in English, so that's probably the version to get. I'm holding onto my 360 copy though because I have this thing. This is an arcade stick for Death Smiles made by Hori, which, if you're unaware, is the gold standard when it comes to fighting game peripherals. I'm a big fighting game and shmup fan, so for every console I have I want to get a fight stick for it. I was looking around on the 360 and nothing was really catching my eye. Either it had too few buttons, it was from a franchise I don't really care about, or it had some sort of weird, gross button layout. What the hell is even that? But then I came across this beauty. An arcade stick for a shmup, and one of my favorite shmups ever? Oh hell yes. This was only released on Amazon Japan, which is why they're now quite rare indeed. If there's a holy grail in my 360 collection, this is definitely it. Save the best for last, eh? I realize this video was a bit light on tips, so let me leave you guys with some parting wisdom. The best advice I can give is just do your research, especially for this generation. Did it get a remaster? Did the remaster release physically? Is the remaster bad? Did it have physical DLC that you can only get on the original? Did the game run better on PS3? But is it back and back? Because then it doesn't matter. Does the PS3 have exclusive content though? These are the types of questions that always run through my head when I'm buying a 360 game. Trust me when I say just spending 60 seconds to read the Wikipedia page and check eBay before you buy will save you a lot of hassle. Because no one likes to buy a game and then realize later there's a different version of something they want. Which has happened to me so many times. I know this library backward and forward, but there's still so many things I'm constantly learning. Even last video I got corrected on something in the comments, which thank you for that. Anyway, the point is, do your due diligence. It'll save you a lot of headaches. So this is going to conclude part 2 of my Xbox 360 game collection series. I will do a part 3 on all my digital games, which will hopefully be a bit shorter, but the response from the first video was so unexpectedly massive that I wanted to get this out as quick as I could to not keep y'all waiting, which, thanks for being patient. A lot more work than you might think goes into these videos, but it really warms my heart to see so many people are interested in learning about and collecting from my favorite console. If you have any questions about anything I've said in these videos, or just about collecting for the 360 in general, then put them down in the comments and I'll do my best to help you out. Other than that, thank you guys for watching and have an awesome day.